The most miraculous thing about Mount Athos may simply be the fact that it's still there. Over the centuries, it's been invaded by crusaders, Ottomans, mercenaries, pirates, and Franks. The Nazis had their eyes on it, too. The 2,000 monks attribute their survival, not surprisingly, to divine intervention. But they've also been pretty crafty. Some of the measures they've taken will surprise you. If you'd like to come for a visit, though, it can be arranged, but it's not easy. First, you'll need a visa issued by the monks. And unless you're an Orthodox pilgrim, it can take a while. Next, you'll fly to Athens and make your way to a scruffy little town in northern Greece where there's no airport and where the roads are dicey. Then you'll hop on a ferry, unless the trip has been canceled because of rough seas. That happens all the time. But on a calm day, it can be a very pleasant ride. The monks will tell you it takes years of prayer and soul searching before they're ready to leave the world for Mount Athos. For the likes of us, though, it takes a little more than an hour. It was the beginning of Lent when we took these pictures, and the ferry was packed with pilgrims from all over the Orthodox Christian world. Greeks, Bulgarians, Serbs, Romanians, Russians. It wasn't long before the first monasteries came into view, and we thought we were sailing to Byzantium, to a fantasy land of castles and palaces. We were headed for Vatopevi, one of the oldest and largest monasteries on Mount Athos. It had the feel of a medieval city. Holiness seemed to seep from the very stones, from the frescoes on the 10th century church, from the marble font for holy water. But then there was the monastery's secular looking centerpiece. There's nothing remarkable about the clock tower at the Vado Petty Monastery, except for one thing. Check out the time. It's just about 8.30. Now, my watch reads 2.30. That's a six hour difference. And there's nothing wrong with their clock or with my watch. It's because the monks on Mount Athos keep Byzantine time. The day starts at sunset, not at midnight. The monks measure time this way during the days of the Byzantine Empire. That's the Christian Empire that followed the fall of Rome. And that's the flag they still fly here. How long ago did the Byzantine Empire fall? 1453. That's a well-known fact. Well, it wasn't to us. But to Father Serapion, 1453 is the day before yesterday. This peninsula is the only place in the world that still keeps Byzantine time. It has maintained this time for some 550 years. It was harvest time when we arrived, and dozens of monks were hard at work in the olive groves on the hills overlooking the monastery. That's where we ran into Father Nikandros from Melbourne, Australia. This place looks like a, like a summer resort, like a holiday resort, like a, it sure like does. a, like a retreat, uh -huh. but it's not. It's an arena. It's an arena? Yes. What do you mean the it's an arena? The unseen warfare. Unseen warfare? That's right. What does that mean? We fight against the angels of the dark side, you see? Of the demon, of, of the devil, the, the Satan. The battle against Satan and the dark side is waged here every day. The spiritual leader at Vatopedi is Abbot Afrem. Here, the life of Christ is experienced in a genuine way. And this doesn't happen in many other places in the world. What I'm talking about is the art of salvation. It just so happened that while we were there, the monks celebrated an elaborate seven-hour vigil, and the church was packed with pilgrims. It's held once a year to honor the archangels Gabriel and Michael. According to the Bible, Gabriel and Michael led the army of angels that expelled Satan from heaven. The church's relics are brought out every day, 
and pilgrims ask for the blessing of the saints. The most sacred relic on the entire peninsula is in this case, fabric said to be part of a garment worn by the Virgin Mary. The irony is that while the Mother of God is revered here, no other woman is permitted to even set foot on Mount Athos. It's been like that for a thousand years. The reason, according to Orthodox doctrine, is that Christ gave the peninsula to his mother, and all other women have been excluded so as to fully honor the Virgin Mary. It's also been said that in the days before the ban, when women did come here, the monks became distracted and couldn't devote themselves entirely to prayer. They say it's been a lot easier since the last lady left. Keeping women out certainly wasn't much of a problem three, four hundred years ago. Do you feel that's becoming problematic today? I don't think so, because the monastery itself and all the land around it is our property. And if we don't want women coming onto our property, we have every right to do that. Mount Athos may be the last all-male bastion in the world, and Father Arsenio says it has to stay that way. Here we are concerned solely with purity and our elevation to eternity. If women are permitted, they bring their families and their children. This place would become a tourist attraction and no longer a place of silence. If we wanted to experience profound silence, we were advised to go to Stavronikita. It's the smallest monastery on the holy mountain, but it has some of the most remarkable treasures. You stay in the silence just by walking in. There's no electricity here, so the icons and mosaics are illuminated only by shafts of sunlight and a few candles. St. Nicholas, the patron saint, John the Baptist, and the Virgin Mary. We were stunned by the magnificence of the art here, but then we ran into Father Maximus, a former professor at the Harvard Divinity School. He told us what we were seeing cannot be described as art. They're devotional objects, and they're part of the living liturgical life of the church. So we don't have any art, and we're not a museum. I mean, to, to put it starkly. Whatever you call it, it's priceless. That's why the monasteries have been invaded and plundered so many times over the centuries. The monks' most recent brush with history happened only 70 years ago. The Nazis were coming their way. In the spring of 1941, the Germans invaded and occupied uh, uh, Greece. They marched up the Acropolis, raised the swastika beside the Parthenon, and were about to invade. The monks asked for a meeting with Nazi officers who advised them to appeal to Hitler himself. And the monks wrote a letter to Hitler. A letter was written, and uh, in the letter, the monks uh, uh, identified themselves. They said, this is who we are. And they asked Hitler to place uh, the holy mountain under his personal protection. What kind of response did you get? Well, uh, it seems that uh, Hitler liked the idea and uh, uh, accepted the invitation to become the personal protector uh, of the holy mountain. Well, let me just get that yeah. straight. Hitler, the personal protector of the holy mountain. That's right, that's right. Hitler did send a team of German academics to Mount Athos. They took 1,800 pictures of the mountain's treasures, and it wasn't because they enjoyed photography. Hitler wanted the monastery's riches in Berlin. The professors were sent as an advance team to catalog the treasures of the Holy Mountains so that a selection of things could be made to be removed. It didn't happen, did it? Uh, no, it didn't. Not a single thing was taken. Father Maximus believes they have the Russians to thank for that, that by the time the Nazi scholars completed their work, Hitler was bogged down in Russia and wasn't thinking about icons. That Nazi period has been largely forgotten here. To the monks, it was just one more blip on the road, and a small one at that. Today, Vatopedi is the most popular destination on the mountain. It hosts 35,000 pilgrims a year, and offers more than spiritual sustenance. The monks have their own fishing boats, and the catch is pretty good. 
the fish are served fresher than in any Greek restaurant. The refectory dates from the 12th century, and since the 12th century, the food here has been free. Vato Pedi has been supported by rich benefactors, emperors, princes, kings, and today, partially by pilgrims with deep pockets who commission icons in the making. But the ancient treasures? Not a chance. They can't even see them. They're under lock and key. It's not a new security system, but it works. Normally, it takes more than one monk to unlock the door because no one monk is allowed to have all four keys at the same time. It's sort of a medieval version of the nuclear launch control. Do you keep those keys in your pocket, Father? I try not to. Father Matthew from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, was given the abbot's blessing to let us into the inner sanctum. Once inside, there was still another hidden door. Behind the curtain, we walked into the world of Byzantium. It was hard to imagine that everything here was at least 600 years old because the brilliance had not faded. There are almost 4,000 icons stored in this monastery alone. Oh, wow. The highlight, a 14th century icon of Christ. Every monk will tell you the sole purpose of life on Mount Athos is to get closer to Christ every day. And they say total union with Christ is only possible when they leave this world. The first thing a monk does is embrace and love death. Embrace and love death. Because death is the ticket to the other life. Without a ticket, you can't travel. Where do you get the ticket? In this life. That's what we do each day. We prepare for death. And we are joyful about our journey to heaven. Father Matthew offered to take us to the transit point between this world and heaven. When a monk dies, he's buried until there's nothing left but bones. Then he's brought to where every monk who's ever lived here ends up, the ossuary. Any idea how many skulls there are here? Thousands. I'm not sure how many thousands. Any idea how far they go back? The ones here would be to the 16th century. When you look at the ossuary, what comes to mind? Mostly I see that uh, this is where I'm going to be. I always like to say these are my future roommates. <laughs> there was nowhere for us to go from there. So we headed back to the mainland. The monks invited us to come back any time. And if we do, or if our grandsons or great-grandsons do, after 10 days here, this much we believe. Mount Athos will not have changed at all.